so I think you can see what was going on there. We'll move on. But one of the mistakes that I was doing, you just saw just a second ago, is when I was like, come on, come on. And then he got close to the box. I'm like, okay, let's clean up. You know, I might as well have been talking, you know, French. He didn't know what clean up meant. And I kept saying, come on, clean up, clean up. Like, if I say it again, he might get it. I could say it 20 more times. He'd be like, dude, still don't get it. So what did I do? Well, I got smarter, and this is part of the LSP. Don't tell kids what? Instead of telling or prompting kids what? Model, demonstrate, show, rehearse what you want the child to do. Anything you want the child to do, you do first. What does that do? That teaches kids to look up, look around. Pat, what are you doing? How can I become part of what you're doing? So what I did is I started the cleanup, got it going, and then gave it to him, the pins to him, and he finished what I started. Okay, now speech pathologist, once he understands to clean up, now as we talk about LSP number seven, verbal communication this afternoon, then we would be able to lay language on top of what he knows, which is clean up. But if we're saying clean up, clean up, clean up too soon, he's, we're using a weakness language to teach a weakness social. So he's not gonna get it because words represent what we know. And if he doesn't know what cleanup is, if we keep saying clean up, we're only confusing the child, and that becomes part of the anxiety that children with autism have. What I think is what we've talked about is because this is the hard part, guys. This is the really, really hard part. When the families come in and they say, I want my child to talk, that's like going to school. I want my child to be successful in school. And you go, it's like so much pressure. It's like, I know, I want your child to talk too. But in all of their anxiety about the child and wanting the child to talk and the child being behind the eight ball because of their ASD, this is what I said in my opening comments this morning, is that, okay, we're going to start working on communication right now. But it's not going to involve a lot of verbal communication. And you know what? you got to trust me. Because I have technology right now through prompt techniques to get your child to talk right away or pretty close to right away. And I can teach your child to imitate sounds. And I can do this and this, what's this, what's this, what's this. And, and you know what? You can get 8 out of 10 correct. And, you know, and, and that might be part of what you do. And if you have to do it, you have to do it. But for my money, for effective, efficient treatment in autism, you need to understand, we're trying to teach these kids the soccer game. And then you put language on top of what they already know. Now they're the ones using it. Why? Because it represents what they already know, as opposed to what we're telling them. Kids can be prompt dependent and remain prompt dependent if we teach them in prompt dependent ways. So many kids have a lot of language that they have or learn and can imitate they still don't know what to do with it until we tell them to. These are the kids who are sitting silent, and you're thinking, dude, you just, there's so much you could have just said. If you have a problem, go, you know, go find out, you know. So much, you just kind of like, where's the, where's the hiccup here? Why aren't you using your language? You know why? Because they don't have a game plan. And then, so when we come in and something changes, about that environment, our children start, uh-oh, and the anxiety starts to rise, the emotional dysregulation starts to rise, and things of this nature. And we go, oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Mrs. Johnson will be back tomorrow. It's okay. And they're like, oh, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. You tell me it's okay because you want it to be okay, so we don't, like, you know, tear the room down, but it's, it's and the kid says, it's not okay. And the child gets upset because of this rule, and they look at you because you are what? You're a rule breaker. You just broke the rule. Don't you understand, Pat, that this is how we do what we do? 
Keep it the same. So kids get up and they do all kinds of things to get you back to the rules. Get back to the way we did it. And then everything's going to be fine. You can interact with me, child, friend, as long as you play by the rules. Well, what young peer model or potential friend is going to play by the rules? I don't know about you, but pretty close to zero. Social exchanges. I mean, guys, think about this. When, when you look at conversations and when you have conversations with your friends, 90%, I'm just making that, that percentage up, but a whole bunch of what you talk about are social exchange. I don't need anything from you. I'm not really asking you anything or asking you for anything that's like an object or anything. But most of what I talk to you about is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking, and what are you thinking, and what am I thinking? So it's a social exchange. What glues us together is the social glue. I'm not glued together with you because I need something from you like an object. But if we teach kids in object-oriented ways and in scripted ways, I mean, it, it's over, conversation's over before it even begins. So when we look at social exchange, many of our kids aren't good at social exchange, sitting down, having a cup of coffee, hi, how are you, how's your day, what's going on? Why? Because our kids aren't being taught to be what? Social. <laughs> our kids are being taught in a way to, if you need something, get something by asking somebody something. That's the reason for communication. We, we're going to talk a lot about why kids aren't social in their conversation because that's not the way they're being, being taught. If you're developing a program um, or you're developing an IEP, a plan for your child in different uh, settings, to me, the first thing that you always have to consider is ask yourself the question, how do you know when a child has learned something? How are you convinced professionally and ethically that a child has actually learned something? It's a question that I wrestled with. Because if I say, I'm going to teach you this skill, and I'm going to, I'm going to teach it to you through direct instruction that we all know and love, direct instruction, and then you respond, and I shape your behavior so it's more and more and more correct or more uh, closer to what I'm actually demonstrating to you and teaching you, and it's getting closer and closer, and then you get it at 80% correct. When I tell you this or show you this, you give me this response, and then you do it correctly at 80% of the time, and if you call that learning, then a child has learned something. And then you work on generalization. And you generalize that skill across different contexts, at least three contexts. If you call that learning, then a child has learned the skill. I don't call that learning. I don't call that learning. This is what I call learning. A child will have learned a skill when he or she is able to apply the skill across persons, places, and circumstances, knowing how and when to use that skill. Let me say it again. A child will have learned a skill when he or she is able to apply the skill across persons, places, and circumstances, knowing how and when to use that skill. So let me ask you what you think is the most important part about that definition of learning, given what I just said. What do, you, what do you think might be the most important part about that? It's actually Q. It's on the next line. How, who said that? Good. How and when? How and when? Does the child know how and when to use these skills? Or are we telling them how and when to use these skills. So one of the things that we ask ourselves all the time 
is when we're teaching the children who is doing the thinking. And many of us do not differentiate, I think, clearly enough and make a distinction clearly enough between cues and prompts. Let me give you an example. That means is when you teach a child in one context and you're involved in that context, a child will get really good at learning with you. Some kids will, anyway, or to the best of their ability. But then it's kind of like a snapshot. It's like, I learned this in relation to you at this time. We'll talk about that a little bit more this afternoon when it comes to cognitive flexibility. But what happens is that some of our kids then are in the classroom, and then if they have a question or a need or some communicative need, they're going to weave their way all the way through the classroom to get to what? Get to that one teacher, to get to that one paraprofessional. And many of these kids who are sitting around the table or in that context with, with the child are excellent information, at information, excellent social models, excellent you know, communication models. But if that child is only learning in relation to one person, which many kids are, situation-specific learners, now we're boxing ourselves into a corner. So when we talk about introducing a number of compadres early on, that's one of the reasons is because our kids get locked into one person. That's why they get locked into that paraprofessional because I'm comfortable and you're part of my comfort zone. So we have to understand that children need to learn not in relation to big people, but they have to learn in relation to small people, okay?